Welcome back to Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Keeping the World Company. And I'm joined by my co-host, uh, Tim Apicella, and our special esteemed guest and uh, historical scholar. That's, that means a scholar who is into history rather than a scholar who is herself historical, okay? Uh, that's Jean Rosenfeld. She joins us too. And uh, we are going to talk about the uh, narratives. We can talk about the competing narratives uh, around what is going on in the Middle East. And we're going to examine each one, how they got started, how they are playing out, uh, what effect they're having, and what we can do about them. Uh, so, Tim, let me start with you. Um, how many narratives are we talking about? Uh, are there two? That would, that would be the easy answer, but possibly more. What do you think? Um, two would be the easy answer, and I'd like to go with that if I could, but I won't. <clears throat> um, you also have narratives from the NGOs. Um, you know, they're doing their job out there and, and reporting what they think are the facts. And so it's not just the media, um, you know, in Israel and in the Gaza area and West Bank area. Um, so you, you do have, again, these agencies that are reporting um, data that is pertaining to their mission. And uh, the media services are picking up on those reports and they're reporting it. I, I've noticed a shift since we last spoke um, I've seen mm -hmm. more of a balanced uh, reporting um, going back to um, the initial attacks against Israel and now some of the details of, of how uh, Israelis were slaughtered, uh, wholesale slaughter. And um, those reports are very disturbing. And um, I don't know what prompted the media to shift back to Israel's uh, initial attack by Hamas, but they're doing it at least in the last week. Well, they were criticized, seriously criticized, for spending 95% of their time on the sad, you know, story of uh, the people, uh, the Palestinians uh, in, in Gaza. And after they were criticized, uh, you know, a couple of them, I wouldn't say apologize, that's the wrong word, they um, corrected themselves. But as, as I told you when you first mentioned this the other day, um, that, you know, once you come up with a bad narrative, it sticks. And it's very hard to change, I mean, see if you agree, to, to change the narrative. So if they were doing it the wrong way, uh, spreading the wrong message, putting the wrong emphasis on originally, um, and then they corrected themselves after they were criticized, the damage is already done. Do you agree? I absolutely agree. It's you know, you talk to any propagandist and they know that whoever gets the first message out and repeats it several times, um, the retention of that particular story um, is retained. Yeah. There, was, there are sub narratives like that the hospital where the parking lot was blown up. And the first thing that happened instantaneously uh, was that Hamas reported that um, it was it was the Israeli Air Force. Um, that wasn't true. Um, some some media just never accepted the Israeli proof uh, that it wasn't true, that it was actually an errant rocket from uh, the jihad. Um, and so the first story stuck. And if you looked across the world today, I suggest that in that sub-narrative, or maybe it's part of, you know, the larger Palestinian narr narrative, uh, you will find most people accept what Hamas came up with as the story and reject or don't know about the Israeli side of it. Do you agree? Yeah, I do. Um, I also like to offer an example of how a narrative sticks. And um, re despite numerous retractions, the original narrative sticks. Remember Pizzagate in New York City? Mm -hmm. You ask a lot of uh, mega people and they, <clears throat> they swear by the fact that Pizzagate was a real story and um, there was nothing as far as a retraction that appealed to them. So, you know, we do have, you know, responsible newspapers and media outlets that make mistakes. They're honest mistakes. Um, the retraction is printed, but the retraction never is really remembered that often. And so that's, that's part of the dilemma is that the human, the human condition, the human brain kind of sticks with what it hears first and um, kind of glosses over any retractions uh, subsequently. Yeah, Gene, to you, um, on the larger picture here about humanity, you know, that uh, Tim refers to, it seems to me that uh, one station makes a mistake and goes for 
a certain blood and gore narrative, um, and then the others follow. So what you find is a sort of a bubble of narrative. And if the narrative that they copy is wrong, then they're all wrong. Uh, likewise, I think that same phenomenon exists out in the street. Uh, if some group, uh, if some, what are you going to call it, influencers uh, pick up on a narrative and somebody copies them, they're likely to copy what's in that bubble. And then you have 100,000 people in London all on a narrative that could be wrong, in my view, that it is wrong. But what is this about human nature, about the species that calls for us to copy um, the first statement, copy um, the blood and gore approach, um, copy a narrative that is wrong. I would suggest, and you're the uh, an historian, but uh, uh, it seems to me that um, this has existed throughout history. Well, you know, I have um, heard others who are not historians that are more expert than I in psychology and uh, come up with some ideas. Uh, first and foremost, your peer group. And you're disposed to listen to your peer group. And your general attitude is going to be influenced by them. Mark Sageman has talked about terrorists recruiting among bands of brothers. These are young men who are pretty footloose and uh, are searching for some hero role for themselves. And they tend to band together and think the same way. So they're ripe for recruitment. A second thing we've learned from a scholar named Ramsey McMullen uh, some time ago about conversion. How do you convert somebody? What has happened with Hamas is they had these narratives ready for dissemination, many of them. And also the human rights groups like Amnesty International have already predisposed a lot of people to blame Israel for what's going on with their um, accusation of apartheid in the world court. So we have a number of things that are going on here, both at the personal level and at the NGO level, as Tim, Tim figured out. Gene, I want to ask you, um, you know, about something that was covered in the New York Times a week ago, and that is the, the change, the shift in liberalism in the world. Liberalism seems to fold around these things. You know, you talk about, for example, just one of many examples, amnesty. Amnesty International, um, you know, before, in my view, it was a liberal organization. Uh, now it's buying into a, a narrative that is not liberal at all. Um, and, and that's so for a lot of liberal organizations and a lot of people, uh, liberal, formerly people we would consider liberal. And it may be a factor in what's happening in the campuses and streets of the United States. Um, but, you know, what, what is going on? Uh, do you agree with that shift, the statement of that shift? And what is going on here that Amnesty International would actually side with terrorists? Amnesty International has prepared a number of reports on the Israeli-Palestinian issue. Their earlier reports examined the Palestinian Authority and the government in Gaza, which took over from the Palestinian Authority around 2006, and they criticized the leadership of the Palestinians for not providing for their people, for not negotiating for peace, for a number of things. And then all of a sudden, recently, a year or so ago, they came out with a report that was so biased, I couldn't believe it. I mean, it wouldn't, in, if it were in uh, a paper presented in my class on history, I would give it a failing grade because it's only one side. They used only Palestinian sources. They complained only about the Israeli government jailing people, not the Palestinian Authority jailing their own people. They complained about Israel uh, affecting the infrastructure of Gaza, did not complain about the fact that the Gazan leadership did not provide enough water and sewage and infrastructure as well. I don't know why they suddenly shifted their uh, their perspective, why they did not use their previous uh, research and incorporate that into a more balanced report. You know, today what's happening, if you look at the general news media, if you go to Al Jazeera, they have printed 
the Palestinian narrative, one to one to ten. And no other outlet that I know of has done that simple thing. And if you look at Fox News, it is four square behind the Israeli narrative. So what do you do when you go to the media? Well, you take the extremes and you drop them. You get rid of them. You look at what's in the middle, basically. But people don't know how to do that. The, the colleges have not really been teaching critical thinking. Too much bias and emotion has crept into the classrooms. One professor was just interviewed, I believe it was at Cornell, and saying she had no idea when these protests bro broke out after October 6th, that these students had so much emotion going. Um, she had no idea. Well, where has she been? <laughs> you know, if you talk to young people, they're uh, very susceptible to the BDS movement, which has been going on for some time. And as I said before, the principle of Ramsey McMullen, if you have accepted certain things before something is across your threshold and trying to convert you, already accepted part of the message, like the BDS message, which has been going on for a number of years, or the AI message that it, Israel is an apartheid state, then you're more disposed to accept the whole thing. Tim, to you on the timing issue, you know, we spoke a few minutes ago about, um, you know, for example, the Hamas message gets out instantly uh, as if it were planned. And I personally believe it was planned um, and it, it, uh, it, it, it circumvents the world. Um, it's everywhere in minutes, you know, with social media, electronic communications, and it sticks. OK, so the, the question is. One is um, first in time, first to influence the world. That seems clear. But then it seems that, that, that as Jean says, it picks up and it spreads um, through the bubbles of individuals and, and their peer groups and so forth. Mm -hmm. But my question to you is, what happens then? In other words, does it stay forever? Um, does it diminish over time? Are people capable, are these groups capable of re, rethinking it, um, uh, or does it just get worse? Well, Ooh. go ahead, Jean. I was just going to say one thing, and then I'll pass it to you, Tim. One thing I do want to say, too, is the importance of visuals. Uh, we're finding out that some of these photographs of Palestinian children in Gaza uh, the corpses lying on the ground, people looking at it, it, sitting in the midst of rubble in despair, blood all over. Those are from Syria from years ago. They're picked up and they're circulated by those who have the intention of doing it because they're already bought into the narrative. So you have an army of narrators on both sides who are promoting things by using, by falsifying, by using and abusing the media. Hmm. I'm gonna come back to you on that, but let me go to the question I, I put to Tim. What's the time factor here? What's the dynamic? Oh, I, uh, if, I think, I, I think if, a, if, if, a, if a lie has been accepted, uh, it takes a lot of time to dispel that lie or you know, a narrative, a false narrative, a, lot of, a long time. And in some cases, it never is, is dispelled. Um, just look at urban myths. <laughs> some of these urban myths we have in this world, in this country, are ridiculous. And we all know they're not true, but yet they exist and they, they have a life of their own for decades. Um, just one example. I, I also want to kind of tag on to you know, our discussion about the narrative. And I'd be interested in to see if Gene you know, kind of agrees with my opinion or not. And that is, you know, for years now, um, the narrative and, you know, the, the official position by the United States government was supportive of a two-state uh, solution. And then we saw that two-state solution kind of evaporate because um, Netanyahu wanted to, didn't really support a two-state solution, and he started immediately building uh, developments in some of these areas that would be part of the two-state solution. So I think there was a, a narrative that Israel was not proactive or, or being aggressive enough for a, a solution that many countries bought off on, including the United States. 
And so that narrative, that narrative isn't helpful as it pertains to this, this current crisis we're in. Uh, Jean, what do you think about that? Yes, uh, Benjamin Netanyahu in the year 2000, when he wasn't prime minister, it was between his administrations, uh, went to a, a meeting of heads of state and military people in Herzliya and said straight out, he thought the biggest problem of the 21st century would be the desire for self-determination. And if you read that, it means Palestinian self-determination. And Gershom Gorenberg, uh, the American journalist who made Aliyah to Israel warned shortly thereafter when he went back into uh, power when the Netanyahu administration again came on the line around 2009 that um, he was very, very worried because Netanyahu was going to let the third temple messianists into his government. And he was not in favor of a two state solution at all. And I don't think Israelis today agree with him. And I think if anything comes out of this terrible conflict, it will be, again, uh, a real push by other world states to encourage a solution, a final solution to this whole problem politically, which is a two-state solution, uh, at least right now. And you have to understand, too, that it wasn't just the United States and Israel that were backburnering. Bernie, the, the, the two-state solution, it was Saudi Arabia and Egypt, and the Palestinians uh, felt they had to do something to get it back on the table. This is pretty extreme, but I think they may have achieved that. So, Gene, uh, my question is, just real quick, is did that history uh, basically create a broad brush stroke over today's uh, reporting of events? Is that a precursor or was that a precursor that um, tainted objective reporting? In, in the sense that people were feeling that Israel wasn't serious about uh, a Palestinian agreement. Yes, yes. I, I do believe that on the left, we talk about the shift, the liberal shift, some liberal shift, not all. Um, I think that may have motivated liberals and organizations like Amnesty International to start listening more to the Palestinian narrative, yes. You know, I, I saw a video from Prager University, and um, I guess they're on the Zionist side of all this, but um, what they said, Gene, was that on five, and they showed you historically the five occasions, um, a two-state solution had been proposed to the Palestinians. Uh, all the way, you know, to the early part of the 20th century and forward. And um, they documented, or at least they covered in their video, uh, what had happened to suggest or propose um, a two-state solution. And in each case, um, the Israelis or the Jews, depending on what time you're talking about, um, agreed. They were happy to do it. And in each case, the Palestinians, uh, whatever you called them at the time, because, you know, the, the, the name, the nomenclature Palestinian really only took place recently. I guess it was just before or just after the War of Independence in 47, 48. Um, in each case, the Palestinian group rejected it. Um, and and that, that puts a certain light on this. Uh, now, if you, if you say, well, that's not a completely accurate statement. Um, okay, um, but but it still hangs out there for me. Uh, if it is an accurate statement, it it is really a condemnation of the whole two state idea. Because if they tried two states five times before, why in the world would it succeed now? Um, the Palestinian camp narrative on this is let's kill all the Jews and destroy the state of Israel, and we're not going to negotiate for peace. Um, we're not going to cooperate in any way. We have to get to our mission. And so um, it really depends on, on the history, doesn't it? So were there five occasions? Can you talk to us about that? I can't talk to you about each occasion, except Oslo came the closest, and then Yitzhak Rabin was assassinated by groups that today support the extreme right coalition of Netanyahu's government. 
And this is this was a disaster for Israel, I feel. The biggest sticking point in my estimation for a solution on both sides is the settlements. The settlements uh, have been in essence occupying land that the Palestinians want for their state. So in each, you have to look at each attempt for a solution to see what was it that, you remember it was uh, Yasser Arafat and uh, the PLO that were basically the ones that had to make the agreement. Were they serious? Probably not because they didn't, they not only didn't want settlements, they, they didn't want that small piece of land either. They wanted more land. And when once Netanyahu was on board, were the Israelis serious? Probably not. What's different about today is that we have a war going on. This is the worst outburst in terms of Israeli casualties and Palestinian casualties in the history of Israel. They've never seen anything like it. And it's, it's threatening to be a wider war. The United States is engaged in a polarized world against Russia and its proxies and Iran and its proxies. So it's a change situation. The stakes are much higher. And what we're witnessing right now, regardless of where the visuals and the reports are coming from, what we're witnessing right now is heartbreaking. Indeed, but one, one thing becomes clear is that this was the worst uh, massacre of Jews uh, since the Holocaust. This was uh, really special and it really struck their conscience. It was beyond description, beyond imagination. And so their response, not, not all Israelis feel that way, but uh, enough of them feel that way. You could say this is this Israeli response. And it's more than a response, I think. It's, uh, I think it's motivated by the, the notion that whatever you do, we give them land, give them all of Gaza, all of Gaza, uh, give them land on the, on, the, on the West Bank, the same thing, they'll be back. Not necessarily for more land, but to, you know, to, 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 to implement that mission of destroying Israel and killing Jews and not making peace. You know, what did Golda Meir said uh, that uh, you can never negotiate for peace with someone who wants to kill you? And it goes further. You can never negotiate with peace who, with someone who was sworn not to negotiate for peace. So you know, this is really there's so many narratives and sub narratives and and exaggerations and 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 PR campaigns going on on so many levels. Um, I think just as this is the worst war Israel has seen since the Holocaust in its history, this is the worst uh, propaganda war Israel has ever seen. And at first, let me offer that at first, in the first few days, uh, Israel could have taken command of the information, but didn't want to show the pictures of the people who were, you know, killed um, or worse, you know, beheaded, burned alive, what have you. Um, they didn't want to show it because it was distasteful. I mean, there's a certain thing in the, in the Jewish culture that uh, stands against making that public. It's disrespect for the, for the body and the family and so forth. So they didn't show it. At the same time, you know, uh, Hamas is showing pictures of uh, those kids in the streets, and Hamas is ready. Hamas has those pictures of Syrian kids, you know, from another time, phony photographs from another time. We have seen that before. Remember a scandal about Reuters? Uh, this is a couple of wars ago. Reuters was taken in, and there was some. There was a doll. I don't know if you remember this. There was a doll. Some kid was hanging on to. Uh, some Palestinian kid, and uh, Reuters uh, published that. But then when you looked at it carefully, it was the same doll as in another picture, and another picture, and another picture, suggesting that this was all staged. And it was. It was staged. Uh, it all. It also is remarkable that these pictures we get uh, from Gaza about all these kids, they, 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 they flow at us. Um, there are people out there with cameras taking pictures and sending them in and putting them around the world. So we've talked about this, we've all talked about this before, it's the information war. We're dealing with an information war, and at first I think Israel didn't, didn't really report on that. 
Um, now, later, they're reporting more on it. And maybe that's maybe, uh, Tim, that got something to do with the fact that the press is covering it because they're getting the information before they weren't. Um, but, but Tim, I want to go to another question. And, and, and this is the, the secondary thing. So you have all this mm, narrative and misinformation, disinformation that's already sort of fixed in the channels of information around the world. Where does that take this war? Because as we've discussed before, in part, maybe in substantial part, this war is an information war. Hamas is sophisticated. It knows that. Where does that take this war? Well, in my opinion, it could um, further polarize positions. Um, Netanyahu could just say, I don't care what's being reported anymore. It's all about, you know, much of it's misinformation. We're going to do what we're going to do. Uh, damn world opinion. And so it hardens one's uh, line, if you will. And uh, that's not a position you really want to be in when you need allies in the Middle East and you're forcing your allies into a kind of a hardened position. Um, and I think that's what happens is uh, people just give up and say, world opinion be damned. I'm, we're moving forward. And in some cases, you could even... Um, accelerate or, or increase the amount of a kinetic war. Yeah, I mean, your comments remind me of a story in, uh, I guess it was today's Times, uh, about one of the Arab nations recalled its ambassador to Israel. So they're cutting diplomatic ties. And uh, this, I forget, it's a smaller nation, a Bahrain, it was Bahrain. Um, and they're cutting diplomatic ties, and I expect other Arab countries will do the same. Um, and, and, and we were, that is, Israel was friendly with Bahrain before. Uh, there was, a, there was a, a light at the end of that tunnel, but now not. And uh, this, this could have uh, other, other effects. So in the end, you know, Gene, is, is Netanyahu going to prevail if he ignores this world opinion that has been created and that is popping up hither and yon with protests and terminating, uh, you know, negotiations with other Arab countries and the like. Um, can he prevail this way? Let's assume he does have a terrific army. Let's assume that the Air Force really can, you know, destroy the tunnels. Let's assume that the, the troops are as strong as we would hope they would be. Can he prevail on the kinetic side and ignore uh, the public relations side? He can prevail on the kinetic side and he can lose on the information warfare side, which may be more serious. Uh, you have to win on both. He's got to win on both battlefields. And um, the information warfare is something that has a long shelf life. Um, if, if the UN, for example, which is now saying that Israel may have um, committed humanitarian crimes in its conduct of the war. If uh, there's enough opinion that, that they, Israel needs to be tried for that after the war, it will taint their victory on the kinetic side. Um, Joe Biden is already now calling for, for not a ceasefire, but a pause. See, Hamas wants a ceasefire. And they're drumming up and ginning up world opinion as much as possible through the visuals for a ceasefire. Now, I'm not saying that it's a bad idea to pause, but it, it throws a jackhammer into the kinetic war. So you see how the information war can be more important than the kinetic war, can affect the kinetic war. In the meantime, we're losing sight of the fact that there are negotiations going on. Um, and as long as there are negotiations going on with Hamas over the hostages, Israel needs a presence on the battlefield in order to negotiate from strength. So we have to look at three things, negotiation, the kinetic war, and then the information warfare. It's complex, but they all play into one another. And we have to look at what Hamas's preconceived ideas are and what their preconceived objectives are and what they're calling for and how they utilize what influence they have now on people who are convinced um, to, to change the equation in terms of a military victory. Mm. 
Well, win, lose, or draw, it seems uh, Israel, at least on the public relations side, has been damaged. Um, and uh, it's really tragic because, uh, uh, you know, um, we, we did lose 1,400 people to horrific massacres. And that, that is no longer, you know, the issue. The issue was those children in those graphics in Gaza, even though the Israelis did the knock-knock thing on the building buildings and asked them to move south and did all they could to limit, um, you know, uh, limit the, you know the loss of life and so. Um, but they they believe that unless they do this is to me a driving tactical issue. If unless they do something, it will happen again, because Hamas, as long as it exists, is sworn to kill Jews, destroy the state of Israel. And, and if, it, if Hamas continues to exist, you can bet your bottom dollar this will happen again. So, I mean, Israel has a problem either way um, on, the per, on the public relations side. But also, if they capitulate, if they treat Hamas as a you know, legitimate, civilized organization, not a terror organization, <clears throat> uh, it'll happen again, which is maybe the worst result of all. So I guess my question, Tim, is um, has Israel lost on a long-term basis the PR war? Look at those college campuses. Look at those universities. Look at the liberals who have turned against it. Um, look at the United Nations, uh, which you know, doesn't do anything anyway. Um, but you know, look at look at Europe. Look at this this huge global effect. That this PR war has 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 had, is having, will have, um, is is this a permanent loss of respect for Israel? No, I don't think it's permanent, but it's going to have an impact for a long time to come. Um, I also think the PR war intertwines with the political war, and I'll put this out there, and I don't I don't know, um, it's an opinion. I think Netanyahu knows his political days are over. I think because they were Israel was caught off guard, that lands squarely at his desk. And I think Netanyahu is now thinking about legacy. And what is that legacy? Well, uh, if I'm Netanyahu, in my mind, I'm going to show the I'm going to show in Israel history that I did everything I could to cut the head off of Hamas. And I'm going to do so, um, damn PR, um, making Israel look bad for right now. And I, I, I don't know why I think this, but I just think that Netanyahu likes to be uh, that strong leader, um, you know, be perceived as, as tough as Moshe Dayan or George Patton or, um, uh, <laughs> you know, any other uh, strong general. And I think that's the legacy he wants to leave Israelis to remember him by. That he wasn't, he wasn't going to capitulate to the terrorist acts of Hamas, and he did everything in his power to stop it and cut the head off of Hamas. Uh, I don't know if he'll be successful because it's hard to, uh, you know, uh, decimate a terrorist organization when they easily infiltrate back into civilian populations. I saved the most difficult question for you, Gene. <laughs> are, are you ready? <laughs> no, go ahead. <laughs> what all that considered, what do we do? What do we do now? And I'll start with uh, the campuses and the streets of the United States, which are really screwed up on this issue. Uh, what do we do now in terms of world opinion, in terms of relating to countries, allies in Europe and um, gee, everywhere? Um, what do we do now to protect and preserve Israel from? from being destroyed. What do we do now? We listen to the wisest voices in our midst, and there are plenty of very wise voices. Uh, Gershom Gorenberg has called for Netanyahu to step down. I think there has to be more pressure on Netanyahu to step down. And that may be part, as I said before, it's a radical idea, but it's one that my son, who is pro-Palestinian gave me, and that could be part of the negotiation. Secondly, we need to have humanitarian pauses and dial down 
the rhetoric and the uh, emotion surrounding the terrible plight of the Gazan people who are caught in this terrible war. We've never seen visuals and reportage like this before in wars like this. There have been wars like this. And we can't avoid, quote unquote, collateral damage in urban warfare like this against an enemy that started the war is trying to create an opinion that it is a victim while it is refusing to negotiate the hostage release and it deliberately wanted to create this chaos. Who is going to confront Hamas and deal with Hamas? Only Israel is doing that. So yes. that's one thing that we have to keep saying again and again. You know, you can wish for a ceasefire, you can wish for a settlement, but you gotta bring Hamas along. Who is gonna do that and how are we gonna do it? And right now the Israelis are doing it for us at great human cost, but the, Again, they are acting out of a moral tradition of a just war. They're employing the tactics. The tactics aren't going to always work. But whose fault is that? How do you compel Hamas to do the right thing as well? Let's keep uh, our perspective straight here. Let's keep our facts straight. We need to do more for the Palestinian people. We need to provide for them. And I think Israel is doing more. They're letting more trucks in. They're letting more people out. They're trying to be careful that Hamas doesn't escape to the south as well and create mayhem. But it's an impossible task. This is terrible war. And somehow the United States, the United Nations, the other Arab nations need to step up to the plate, help the Palestinians maybe through humanitarian pauses, maybe by opening up the border more to Egypt, whatever they need to do. But you can't just lay this all on Israel and you can't tell Israel to stop fighting Hamas. I mean, the word, you used the word uh, earlier in the show, conversion, you know, and I suggest that uh, the conversion really needs to apply to the Palestinians because they have had, you know, a, a lifetime of hate. Uh, and they and they are uh, committed to uh, you know killing Jews and destroying Israel. I I, I remember um, one uh, piece of footage that came out of uh, of Gaza, and it was uh, a, a woman who was had been raped apparently and maybe tortured, and and she was in the back of a truck and she was naked, and she was being paraded um, through the streets of of Gaza, and the crowds were enormous. And the crowds were celebrating all of that. Those crowds were not limited to Hamas. Those were Palestinian crowds. So I think the Palestinians have been affected more than any, anybody else by this PR campaign. And they have been converted to the Hamas point of view. And they have to be reconverted, which is going to be very, very difficult. I don't think people recognize that. Tim, uh, final thoughts. Final thoughts is, um, I think, I think uh, Netanyahu is going to do what he's going to do. Uh, I think his, he knows his career is over. And um, again, as I've already said, he, he wants a legacy of being the guy that did his best and his utmost to stamp out Hamas. I don't think he'll be successful, but that's what he's going to try to do. And I don't see, we, we see a ceasefire in, in the immediate future at all. This is all an enormous historical tragedy. Looking at it from the point of a view of an historian, you have to compare it with some of the greatest tragedies in human history. Um, but Jean, what, what are your final thoughts that you would leave with our audience? I think that the kinetic war is being somewhat moderated by the position of the United States, because in very practical terms, even though Netanyahu is a hardliner and he wants to stamp out Hamas, he's had to listen to the United States. Israel can't win this war without the United States. And they know there's gonna be an election pretty soon. So that's one real politic factor here. I think, Tim, there will be a ceasefire sooner than perhaps we think uh, being able to sustain this level of emotion, 
polarization, negative consequence, um, casualty levels is going to be well nigh intolerable over the long term. And I think more and more certain Arab states are going to get into the mix in trying to affect this. But again, once again, what the Israelis can do and what the people who are uh, who recognize that Israel is the only Jewish state in the world and a very necessary state are going to have to do is they're really going to have to put the um, um, pressure on Netanyahu in a way that he's never felt before. Yeah, and the big question there, there is uh, when? Now? Right now? Today? Throw him out now? Um, uh, put that pressure on right away? Or put it on later at some other demarcation point? I would like to offer my own last thought. Um, it's like they say, um, are we going to have a World War III? Well, some people think we're already in World War III, and that World War III is, uh, is sort of a subdued version of what you might expect as a kinetic World War III. And in terms of applying that kind of analysis to what's happening in the Middle East, I think the Middle East has been at war since um, before 1947, um, and it's still at war. And furthermore, that it will always be at war. The only question is whether it breaks out into you know this kind of violence. Um, but I think um, you talk about a war and stopping the war, it'll never stop. It is what it is. That's my closing thought. Anyway, thank you very much, Tim. Tim Apicella and Gene Rosenfeld, thank you for this interesting and very informative discussion, very thoughtful discussion. Uh, some of these points have been really, really, really worthy. Uh, we'll see you next time. Aloha. Thank you.